Uh, thank you for being here. We are very happy that we can organize the seminar. This is an advanced seminar. We will bring to the seminar news technology. We won't let you to apply news technology and we will it apply in a field, namely language technology, where it's very important. Um, Weimar and Leipzig are organizing this in parallel. We have different examination um, criteria a bit or different examination boards and hence we give different credits for this and we have slightly different uh, requirements for you, but all together you do the same, more or less. And uh, we have of course obey the local rules. I want to say this here because so that you do not wonder if you the Leipzig people do more or less or the Weimar people do more or less in a certain regard. That near, that's nearly all what I want to say and I would like to hand over to Martin then. What you can expect today is an introduction as announced on the web page. And uh, this will be given by um, Nicholas. Lukas and um, Yannick a bit, I guess, and Michael. And they will introduce themselves. And of course, you're open and ask to ask us questions. And um, I hand over to Martin now. Martin, please. Thank you very much, Benno. Um, Niklas, if you can switch over to the to showing the screen share. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Benno. Um, I will also not be, I will also be brief. Um, and I want also to thank you in particular in Weimar for uh, making this possible. Also for us here in Leipzig and this joint teaching is maybe a bit of the future that we could see here uh, uh, also uh, trying to bring the best of knowledge to everyone across universities. And perhaps we will make arrangements that maybe, I, I cannot promise too much, but perhaps we can make arrangements that the guys over in the different places can meet. But uh, we will see what happens. I want to give a very brief introduction to the Webis group since you're probably wondering, oh, why is it not uh, Temir that is presenting? Why is it now someone from somewhere else? Um, uh, the key uh, to knowing this, and you've probably seen this at some point when browsing through our web pages, um, is that we are joined as a group across universities. And this is called the Webis group. We have a kind of a catchphrase, uh, information is nothing without retrieval, hinting at one of our major research topics, information retrieval, which is incidentally also um, uh, part of the denomination of my chair. Um, but we are doing much more. This uh, pertains to web mining, machine learning, in particular applied machining, as well as some theoretical machine learning, computational linguistics, and even symbolic AI, which is Benno's uh, uh, forte. So um, who are Webis? Um, we are composed of, meanwhile, uh, a number of groups, uh, five, it is, that don't even fit on the screen. Uh, um, recent addition has been Khalid al Khatib, who has been before in Weimar, then intermittently in Leipzig and has now gotten his own assistant professor in Groningen. Um, Matthias Hagen in Halle, whom you may have noticed at some point or other, um, myself, Benno in Weimar and Professor Henning Wachsmuth, meanwhile in Paderborn. And uh, we are all working very closely together on all of these topics, uh, everyone in different specialization areas. If you want to uh, learn more about the individual groups, all you have to do is click on the chair link here and you will see the individual web pages. Some of these links point to our centralized pages. For example, uh, if you go to the lecture notes link, there you will find all kinds of different lectures that we give across universities, also for your personal learning. I will not go too deep into this now, but you will also find the slides for the seminar here or uh, in, in, at least in the future, if not uh, already for the, for the seminar directly. Our research directions are a bit elaborated here. I will not go too deep into this, but as I said, uh, uh, we are doing information retrieval, natural language processing, data mining, and machine learning, as well as the necessary tool development, especially for our purposes of doing this on a large scale. One of our um, biggest accomplishments of recent years, 
just one of them, but uh, uh, big in terms of big data has been the acquisition of the um, web archive project here, which is listed here. And this is a joint collaboration with the Internet Archive in San Francisco, where they allow us to access their data at scale, to download their data to our own data centers, and in order, uh, in order to process it uh, uh, locally, in order to make web archives in general more amenable for research as well as uh, to harness what is in there because much of what is what is currently online on the web uh, uh, does not even come close to what has been online in the past and there are a lot of hidden treasures there that together with you we want to uh, lift from there and this is basically what part of the seminar is about the other part is language technologies which pertains particularly also to the modern language technologies machine learning and you will learn much more about that one part of the seminar uh, is also of course as i mentioned not just the data itself but also the facilities that we offer and these include especially cluster computers to which you will be exposed in this term um, which you will have the chance of using and I also will not go too much deeper into this because this will be probably something that you will learn one step after another. Uh, uh, and Niklas and Lukas, as well as Yannick and Michael on the other side, will be there with you in order to take small steps in this direction. So this seminar, if everything works out as, as, as we planned, is about you learning not only to do machine learning on GPUs, on many GPUs if you want to and if it, if it, if it becomes possible, but also uh, harnessing big data sets in order to do so. And that is basically it from my side. Most of the seminar um, uh, will be run uh, by our uh, by you doing the work, actually. Uh, uh, of course, being mentored by us here in Leipzig, as well as being mentored in Weimar. And uh, Benno on the side will give a lecture uh, regarding uh, transformer models, especially, and machine learning in general, advanced machine learning in general. I hope I've covered more or less everything, Benno. Um, um, I would you did very well. Thank, 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 thank you very much. And you did very well. Okay. Michael, you were saying? Uh, I would just say um, I would take over from here then. Yannick, I did how not many get the... students are already on site in Weimar? Oh, um, if you can turn out the camera very quickly, or is it too, too difficult? Well, exactly one still. Okay, okay, I see, but also not too many in Leipzig. Leipzig. Don't know okay. how you do it in the long run. So I'd say, say 20-ish to 30-ish. I did not know. Oh, this down. is good. This is nice. We expect about uh, 15. <laughs> yeah. All right. well, I hope next week there will be more, or in the week after, whatever the next date is. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what's the next program point? Uh, I will give an introduction to the course organization and uh, a brief overview of the topics that we are going to cover here. And I, then I will mute myself, Michael, and Niklas will switch over to your view or your screen share. Okay. Then uh, just in one minute, or we will give you a go-ahead, I suppose, once we are done. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we can see now the slides that you are operating big data and language technologies. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, then, go ahead. Um, yeah, also welcome everyone in Leipzig and Weimar from my side. My name is Michael Pölzke. I'm with the chair of Web Technology and Information Systems at the University of Weimar. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to um, jointly organize this seminar across uh, two universities. We've done this with a lecture in the past, which uh, I think was very successful and interesting, but uh, never, never with a uh, um, uh, session that is as interactive as this one. It will be new, but I think also very interesting in itself. So um, for my side today, I want to give you a quick overview of uh, how this course will be organized, uh, what we will do, what you have to do, what we expect that you already know. And um, then I will give you a brief intro to the topics that we might uh, talk about, um, but on a rather high level of abstraction for now. Um, so to begin with the, the overall objectives that we want to accomplish in this course, 
are for you to be able to understand and explain the basic concepts of um, current machine learning models for, for language processing, for language understanding and language generation. And uh, we want you to gain some insights into the, the tool landscape that is available to accomplish these tasks um, in the uh, settings of big data and AI-based language technologies. And um, to that end, you will work on a small uh, real-worldish research problem in language technology, and you will get to practice scientific work, scientific writing, and to presentation in the process, and you will get some hands-on experience with uh, cutting edge tools. So um, the course has several components. One is a, a lecture component, as Martin just mentioned. This will be mostly be given by Professor Stein, where um, our goal will be to improve our understanding of the theoretical foundations behind language technologies, uh, especially um, state-of-the-art transformer models. But you will kind of uh, take a slightly historical uh, tour to get there. Um, we will have a uh, interactive labs component that starts today, right after this, where you will um, get some hands-on tutorial uh, experience of um, some of the relevant tools. Uh, we will have a, a first mini project um, on prompt engineering that will start in about the seventh week of the seminar as far as we planned it now, where you'll um, get to know some of the zero shot uh, transfer learning capabilities of the uh, current large language models. And um, the, well, the, the main part of your grade will be a group project that um, we are currently planning to start in about the ninth week. In, this will then take until the end of the semester where you can apply what you've learned to a real research problem. So um, what you will need to do um, to get a grade is first of all, actively participate in the seminar, implement uh, what is needed for the first project. Then uh, we will expect you to write a short uh, project expose and work plan when you have uh, been assigned your topics. You will give a short midterm presentation about your progress um, somewhat shortly thereafter. We are expecting uh, about five minute presentations, but this may vary a bit depending on the number of uh, participants. And finally, you will give a, uh, you will turn in a final report on your findings. We are expecting uh, maybe a bit more than four pages in double column format with uh, proper references. So what to expect from the projects themselves? As I mentioned, they will take about half the semester, so the second half, and will be done in small groups. This might, again, uh, vary also between Weimar and Leipzig. The workload will also be slightly different. In Leipzig, you get uh, 10 credits, and Weimar only six. So this, of course, will be taken into account. The focus on these projects uh, will be on um, practically realizing a uh, research problem. To give you an idea of what um, the, the topical direction will be, although much more details on this will follow. We are thinking along the lines of uh, having you implement uh, web data analytics pipelines or website classification and template induction or several ideas in the direction of large language models, such as benchmarking them or using them for constrained text generation or fine tuning them for specific tasks. We are thinking along the lines of language usage analysis in large web archives or text reuse detection or the ideas in the direction of source code retrieval or malware detection. You can also propose your own ideas. If you have now or in the first half of the seminar, I get any uh, uh, idea that particularly interests you. So please do approach us if that is the case. We are, uh, we have some expectations towards um, what you should already know to participate in this seminar. Most of all, um, we can't really teach you uh, Python programming from the ground up. You will kind of already need to know this. So maybe if you are a um, very high level expert in another programming language, then you can quickly enough teach yourself Python to follow along. But uh, that will certainly be a little more difficult. So yeah, you should already know Python. Uh, it is probably very helpful to have higher exposure to machine learning basics. Especially in Weimar, we kind of expect you to have passed our uh, machine learning course already if you want to be productive uh, in this seminar. You should be comfortable working with Linux or uh, and uh, with command line tools in particular. 
uh, hopefully uh, comfortable using uh, SSH, Git, Linux screen, these kinds of things. And uh, yeah, you, we kind of uh, implicitly expect some uh, computer science background, like uh, algorithms, file systems, networking, especially in the context of uh, these things that I just mentioned. You might have filled out our, uh, our questionnaire already, so I will try to switch to that. Yeah, we have some um, answers from you there uh, already as well. So you can see how you compare to others who have answered this. So most uh, participants here have uh, some uh, level of Python knowledge, as they stated in this uh, questionnaire. So there are some who don't, so uh, those might have to catch up a bit. We have a very um, yeah, wide distribution of command line skills. Uh, basically, on the, uh, by the way, on the left column is the Weimar answers, and on the right, the Leipzig answers, just so you can follow along. So, um, uh, Michael, one is yeah. uh, yes, Benno again. Uh, could you again repeat, or I can also say directly, please, uh, for the Weimar side, fill out the questionnaire so far you haven't done. Yes, you will uh, find them on the Moodle page for this course. If you haven't filled it out yet. So, so far we have 16 answers. So not everyone who has expressed interest in, uh, interest in participating has filled this out yet as of this morning, but uh, yeah. Um, right, so I'll just quickly scroll over this. So um, just so you can see that um, there is um, kind of a wide variety of prior knowledge in the participants here. And if you don't know everything you are not alone. And uh, we can recommend some material to get you up to speed if that is an issue. So uh, for example, the uh, book Deep Learning by Goodfellow and Co. Uh, by the way, um, all of the books linked on the slide, I've selected them because they are uh, available for free online in their entirety. You can use other books as well, of course. So the um, Deep Learning book contains, a, still even though, it, it, it's, uh, even though it's getting a bit old, it contains a very good introduction to the basics of machine learning and the mathematical foundations that you might need. Same goes for the uh, book Introduction to Statistical Learning by um, James et al. The uh, mining of massive data sets um, covers some um, data mining essentials and some algorithms that you might run across. The uh, Linux, Linux command line by Wilson Schwartz is an example of many good tutorials online that are available um, if you are not super familiar with uh, using Linux and command line tools. And uh, Boxes is one example of uh, some intermediate to advanced Python books that might interest you. Um, there is also a book called Neural Networks and Deep Learning, which is uh, by Michael Nielsen, it's more like a website. And then there's our own machine learning course whose uh, slides are available online and um, which you might have taken, or you can uh, find all of the materials here on webstuff.de slash lecture notes for you to review. Finally, for this organizational part, I want to go into a bit more detail on the uh, facilities that we have at our disposal here. Um, the Webis group operates a variety of computing clusters, as uh, Martin already mentioned. We will probably use three of them in some capacity in the uh, course of the seminar. They are called BetaWeb, GammaWeb, and DeltaWeb. Uh, BetaWeb is a um, mainly Kubernetes cluster nowadays and comprises 135 individual servers and uh, makes available a large amount of uh, view cores and a large amount of RAM, which is useful for processing large data sets in a, a distributed, reduced kind of fashion. So you might um, get into contact with this. You might also use GammaWeb, which is our GPU cluster. We have uh, nine nodes at the moment, although we probably will use only six while this seminar is going on. And these uh, six have uh, between them 20 core NVIDIA A100 GPUs, which uh, are useful for training and running um, large neural networks and, uh, efficiently. Finally, we have Delta Web, which is our storage cluster and um, has about 12 petabytes of raw disk space uh, organized in a SEP file system. 
which we will use to store and distribute the data sets that we work with. So that um, covers most of the organization. I would, uh, before I go into a more topic focused part of this introduction, uh, point out an, uh, a related event that is going to happen this Friday which is a um, workshop in the ML democratization tour with Hugging Face that is uh, co-organized by us and in particular Christopher Akiti from Leipzig, uh, where you can uh, basically join for free. I think we've also, also shared the event link to the course pages uh, or the welcome emails. So if you haven't seen this yet, um, go to Waves the events Hugging Face workshop 22. And um, there you can learn some related programming skills that might also come in handy in the seminar. Okay, maybe um, I'll take a quick break here and see if there are any questions. If you have some and haven't asked any yet, you can do so while I figure out how to see the chat. We, we also have a room microphone here, so if you just say something, then I'll need a second to activate it, but then you all over there in Weimar can hear us. I think this also went through. Uh, can you confirm this? Yeah, that looks uh, really nice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, Ed Mike, uh, do we have the possibility to do a small poll? or not in the Zoom meeting? Probably not, yes. Um, yeah, sure. I'm, and Zoom does offer this, but it's, uh, the, the people who are there in person won't be able to answer, of course. I see, yeah, yeah. I only wanted to check uh, how many people from would, Weimar are already there. That's all. I would already uh, or also like to encourage everyone in person here um, to tune in maybe in the Zoom session the load should be available, but um, then we can also all check on the chat when somebody right there. So feel free to also join. Yeah. Ah, okay, no, I see this polling is also complicated. You have to prepare it ahead of time with Zoom. But we can simply use a raise hand feature. So here in the room, but oh, yeah. also Zoom. So if you have any questions, but in particular to ask, just feel free to ask. Yeah, then maybe um, everyone who is currently logged into the Zoom session can quickly click raise hand. Um, so first of all, who is here from Weimar? Um, okay, I see five raised hands. Thank you. That is quite a lot fewer than uh, have signed up on the course page, but not necessarily a problem. Michael, I guess it's a different um, result from the different announcement dates, which we have in Leipzig and Weimar respectively. Yeah, that's possible. So to be safe, we will repeat this experiment next week. Yeah, so in, in Weimar, we have four more, well, three more people right now. Oh, three more people who are already there in person. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. Um, are there any further questions on the organizational details at this point? I couldn't quite understand that. Maybe somebody can repeat it. Who heard it uh, firsthand? Okay, I suppose there are no further questions then let us quickly continue with an overview of what, uh, yeah, of the topics that we are going to deal with in this course. And then um, Niklas and Lukas will um, organize the uh, tutorial for the, for the rest of the day on the first session of that one. So um, yeah, language technologies, um, have and have had a range of goals across their history, right? So for instance, um, we want computers to be able to aid humans in writing. Um, so this can be as simple as uh, correcting mistakes in text. Um, we want to, uh, for example, identify text or be able to um, make spoken or written requests to computers. So this also touches on the areas of information retrieval that we've mentioned. Um, we want uh, computers to be able to help us make sense of text without um, having to read them. This, this is where, for example, summarization or translation technology comes in or information extraction in a wide sense. Um, as the complexity increases, we want to be able to instruct and be advised by a computer. So this is probably something you all know from the navigation systems in your car or your visual assistant. Ultimately, we want to push language technology as far as being able to converse with computers as if they were human and uh, cover the whole um, range of um, yeah, conversation with uh, technology. And this uh, certainly raises philosophical questions as well. So to give you a brief history of language technologies, um, the, as far as I could find um, the, the, the first um, ideas of um, language problems to be solved with the help of computer technology um, was in the area of machine translation. In 1949, uh, Shannon and Weaver uh, formulated a um, thesis that uh, essentially that this should be possible in some very simple um, primitive uh, automatic translation systems appeared already in the 1940s. In the 1950s, Alan Turing um, formulated the idea of the Turing test, which um, gave us a yeah, first way to um, judge how human-like a uh, language technology system is. And uh, Noam Chomsky laid important groundwork in, uh, in grammar in the 50s and 60s. Uh, we had some uh, in the 1960s as computing technology slowly became more advanced. We had some first uh, examples of chatbots. You might have heard of Eliza, which from today's perspective uh, is extremely simple and well, yet was um, yeah, kind of a, a new uh, level at the time. Um, yeah, the 70s and 80s were dominated by um, uh, well, first developments in symbolic AI in, in application to language technology. And uh, the 90s, this um, paradigm was uh, kind of turned over to the statistical energy side, where what we yeah, then came to call machine learning methods came into um, prominence. Um, 
in the 2000s, we uh, had the first neural language models and the IBM Watson project started, which, um, yeah, until 2011 reached, uh, 2011 reached the level of uh, being able to win at uh, Jeopardy. Um, then, of course, you are welcome to interject. Yeah, uh, this is Benno again. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael, for bringing this up. I, there are two thoughts I would like to mention. The Turing test, for those who do not know, was the idea to connect to people by teletype terminal. And um, it was not shown whether on the other side of the terminal this was hidden, a human or computer program would answer the questions or the dialogue that was driven by human on the one side. And uh, the intriguing part of the Turing test is not this um, special setup that uh, this is a teletype. This can also be done with a chatbot or with a VR thing. The, the intriguing part is that the Turing tests can be organized as smart as a person, as a human who is sitting in front. That means if you think you are extraordinarily smart, and you can extraordinary way fool a test. And this was a very new thing. The Turing test is a kind of mirror of their own intelligence. And hence it is accepted so widely as a test of intelligence. This is what I wanted to say. The Turing test is in that sense, not fixed to a complication level or to a weakness level. It depends on the person who sits in front. Uh, the second thing I would like to add the chatbot Eliza uh, was a big success, but this was not planned. It was a demonstration of Weizenbaum uh, that uh, people trust computers too quickly and too much. He simply implemented the uh, a psy, um, yeah, how it's called, a psychologist in the form of a Rogerian, um, Rogerian style, uh, which more or less repeats all input. And although it was very primitively built, Weizenbaum thought he could then wake up the people how stupid computers are, the, exactly the opposite happened. It was a big success and people thought this must be the true intelligence. And the last thing I would like to mention is that IBM uh, 2019 or 18 um, released a um, very interesting system, the uh, project debater which in fact debates a human person. They wanted to go one step further and uh, it, it, it add something to IBM Watson, which is more or less an expert system. They want to get into dialogue because dialogue is very complicated for machines and presented such a system. It's missing in this list here and hence I would like to add this. Anyway, very nicely presented. Thank you, yeah, Michael. Debater is definitely a thing I should mention on this next slide that uh, it's not in here yet. This goes more. Into, Sorry. Uh, uh, anyway, th this is um, uh, an, an impressive system, and I re recommend you look it up. This goes no more in a, let's say, um, individual technologies direction. So um, after 2010, something interesting happened um, in that uh, ideas in neural networks that were invented in some cases 30 years earlier suddenly became interesting for uh, for NLP work. So uh, an example of this is the long short term memory network, which uh, Hochreiter and schmidt came up with in 1997. And it took um, almost 30 years until it was practically useful. And um, in that decade, um, things suddenly started happening very quickly. So we had sequence to sequence models in, in 2014. We had uh, the idea of attention in 2015. And um, this evolved into the transformer model in uh, 2017, which introduced self-attention, um, well, uh, as money and colleagues did. And um, this, um, this uh, led to a um, yeah, kind of zoo of uh, transformer descendants that we have now. Some of these are autoregressive language, language models. Some of these are uh, language encoders. Some of these are signals to signals models. Um, and uh, these are the kind of um, most powerful language technologies that we currently have. You might have heard of uh, OpenAI's GPT-3, which was introduced in 2020, which um, is um, not going on in the chat, but uh, 
Yeah, uh, feel free to to comment via audio also if you like. This doesn't have to be a, a one-way lecture, but it certainly. Is. Um, anyways, I uh, yeah I wanted to point here also to um, yeah some of the uh, the open source models that are available. Yes, uh, I think T zero came out of this big bench project or made uh, significant use of it. Uh, GPT three is the um, largest language model that I know of that um, is well accessible to be used at all if you have access to the OpenAI API. Um, T zero and GPT Neo, for example, are actually available for download as a pre-trained model, and you can you could run it on your own machine if you have one tolerable enough. I want to come back to this point of um, neural language technology suddenly becoming um, interesting in the 2010s. And um, the yeah, best hypothesis I know of uh, why that is the case is the uh, price of computing that crossed some critical threshold then. This is a, a plot of the, um, uh, so this is on, on a logarithmic scale on the y-axis, this shows the cost, the cost in dollars of a single gigaflop worth of compute. So a gigaflop is a billion floating point operations per second which is um, uh, somewhat uh, vague, but at least easy to understand measure of uh, computing power. So to put this in context a bit, um, this uh, cheap Android phone here has a couple hundred gigaflops in its graphics processing unit. And um, the price per gigaflop comes out to uh, around 50 euro cents, I think, on, uh, in today's money. In 1960, a single gigaflop would have cost trillions of US dollars. And um, this price has decreased exponentially if you plot it over time. So the um, same amount of compute today is um, very cheap by comparison. And we have uh, more and more powerful, more and more compact, uh, and also more and more energy efficient compute over time. And um, yeah, that has enabled a in the last couple of years the um, largest language model available up to that point in time being about an order of magnitude bigger every year. And uh, related research has um, found a linear relationship between the number of parameters in the model, the size of the training data set, and um, the compute budget used with the model performance. And there uh, is a scaling law that uh, whose end we haven't really reached yet. So this has been com compared to something like a new Moore's law, where the bigger we make these models, the more powerful they get. Although most recent uh, research has found that this only works when the size of the training data uh, scales accordingly. I want to... Uh, Michael, uh, could, yeah. could you, this was, looked very interesting, but I didn't get fully, probably others also not the, uh, the content or the semantics of the first graph. Could you repeat this? What did of course, yeah, Alex I, should, I should probably go into it. Take the, the time, it, 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 is, it is worth it, really. So, um, yeah, in, the, in this uh, sets of graphs, they, they are from uh, Kaplan 2020, who were the first to make a large scale study of these um, computing budget scaling laws. Uh, all of these plots show on the y-axis the uh, test loss of the corresponding model from a family of related models that they, com uh, they compared. Um, so lower is better, is all we need to know in, in this case. And then they um, yeah, plotted this against the, um, essentially the, the processor time spent uh, training the model, the size of the training data set and tokens and the size of the uh, model parameter space. And um, in any case, the, the bigger each of these three measures on the x-axis is, the better the model performance. Um, as a concrete example, I want to come back to, to this GPT Neo X20B model, which is an open source autoregressive language model um, with 20 billion parameters. The, um, this is a good example because there is a publication available where the authors go into a lot of detail in 
uh, how exactly and on what hardware, uh, hardware they trained this, which for um, the um, for things like the open AI models, this can only be estimated because uh, people don't say this exactly. So in this case, this was trained for two and a half months on 96 NVIDIA A100 GPUs, which is um, about five times the amount of hardware that we have available at our institution. So it would probably be difficult to train a model of this size from scratch, but we can definitely run it in inference. And the training data that used here is called the pile, which is uh, comprises 825 gigabytes or GB bytes rather of um, somewhat uh, strictly curated uh, text from various internet sources. For example, all of Wikipedia is contained in this data set, as well as uh, the uh, parts of the uh, common crawl data set, um, the scientific papers from archives, and uh, so on. And um, yeah, so the, the question then that we also want to uh, kind of deal with here is how to, uh, yeah, how to, how to approach the data curation part. Uh, this, uh, again, yeah. I have a question, Michael, here's a pile yeah. you were mentioning it. Could you tell us about the distribution, especially for the audience between these three kinds of texts? Because Wikipedia is compared to common call very small and the 825 gigabit open source is very skewed in its distribution. If you know the data, if you know the data, if you can tell us. Um, this is a bit of a complicated question because um, uh, for, for this particular model, uh, the authors took into account kind of a, um, yeah, let, let's say a, an intuition of the relative quality of the uh, parts of the same data set. So while Wikipedia is uh, in terms of um, broad size, only a smaller portion of the training data, um, they used it in more epochs of the model training so that it would have a bigger influence, for instance. So it's, um, uh, it wouldn't be entirely correct to say that only 1% of this 825 gigabytes is Wikipedia because the model saw it more often during training, if that makes sense. Okay, don't see any further questions. Um, yeah, I want to, um, and again, uh, th this might seem like a lot of stuff up front, it definitely is, but I uh, kind of want to give a, a, a quick overview. We will go into uh, a selection of the topics that I'm running through here at breakneck speed in um, much more um, detail as it makes sense throughout the course. So I want to quickly touch on how we would approach processing um, a data set of this size. So for this, we need a, a, a kind of a stack of big data processing architecture. This figure is uh, something that we came up with at some point to conceptualize how the different parts of uh, such a stack would work together. So we would um, conceive of this as a, as a kind of layered system where we have a, a data acquisition and ingestion layer at the bottom where we would um, collect the different kinds of structured and unstructured data that we want to work with. In our case, this is all text data and most of it will be unstructured or semi-structured in the sense that we maybe have HTML documents with some markup, but not much more than that. We would um, store this in a kind of uh, distributed file system. So I mentioned SEP in this regard, which is uh, what we use to um, handle kind of the um, initial data ingestion. And then uh, we would uh, structure this data to further uh, manage it and um, extract the information that we need from it. And uh, yeah, finally, in our case, the consumption of the data would um, happen mostly in terms of uh, training the uh, large language models. Um, a final thing I want to mention um, is this figure by, by Matt Turk. Um, he's a uh, venture capitalist in the uh, ML and 
AI space and uh, every year publishes a figure like this that well, kind of hits you in the face with all of the logos of all of the different projects in the space that are currently active. As um, is probably obvious, there is way too much out there than a single person could ever be familiar with. And I think that is mainly the, uh, like this, this shock value is the main purpose of uh, this graph. So this is a bit, um, yeah, you know, structured into what the, the focus of the relative of the various projects are. Many of these are um, commercial uh, enterprises at this point. Um, some of them you will heard of, some of them you won't. I want to zoom in a little bit into the selection of open source tools in the bottom part of the figure here, because these are what we are likely to be using at some point, or at least a small selection of these. So this is um, this bit once again zoomed in. And um, yeah, to give you an idea of what you might learn about in the course of this, um, uh, of the rest of the seminar, we, um, yeah, I mentioned we uh, have a Kubernetes deployment. You will definitely somehow interact with a service deployed on Kubernetes um, in the course of your work here. You might not notice if everything goes well or if you don't have to um, modify it in any way, but this is a key component of our infrastructure here. We use Hadoop and Spark um, and nowadays also Flink a lot to process uh, initial data sets. Um, but especially today in the, the tutorial part of this um, seminar, we, you will learn about Keras and um, uh, later also about the plug and place transformers libraries um, that we use in the machine learning context. And uh, yeah, as you can see, there's a lot more to this. Of course, we also use Python that is clear at this point and you will probably also stand us in that context, but um, yeah, there are uh, many other tools out there and you will probably never know all of them. But I think a uh, key insight you can gain from a seminar like this is also a bit to, to lose the fear of this uh, um, jungle of, uh, of options and maybe learn to be able to judge a bit better what tools are useful for your use case at hand. So that um, covers it for this introduction from my side. You are very welcome to ask questions, but it's also okay if you don't have any at this point, we will definitely have further opportunities to talk about these things. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Oh yeah, also thank you from my side. I guess I'm unmuted now, so you can again hear me. Um, if there are any questions from our audience in Leipzig, I would be happy to transfer them. Otherwise, I would continue um, with some setup for the tutorial. Should I talk a bit louder? Is it okay like that? A bit louder? Okay. Um, Okay, if there are any questions, just raise your hand at any point or interject me. Otherwise, I would continue by sharing my screen. Um, and just quickly go over some organizational stuff that has not yet been mentioned, uh, which is also particular for Leipzig. So I just want to quickly bring up the uh, Leipzig course page. Um, and wait, I don't have my iPad. Ah, hello. that's what I was searching for. Um, and there are some questions that we wanted to ask you. And the first one is that we send out a welcome mail uh, to all the students who have registered for by the Studium Bureau. Um, but unfortunately, up until now, we don't have the list of all the people who registered. So we don't know if our welcome mail actually reached everyone. Um, if you haven't gotten a welcome mail from us yet, either write me or write a mail to Niklas. You can find our contact details uh, either just by clicking on our names on the um, course website. So if you haven't gotten the welcome mail yet, uh, please please get in touch with us. 
Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is that we have a dedicated Discord server, um, which you, if you got the welcome mail, you might have already seen. Um, and you can join this Discord server. There are a couple of different lectures. So in this semester, we teach not only big data and language technologies, but also information retrieval. And all of these courses are like centralized there for you to get in touch with us very easily and maybe ask questions uh, about the course material. Um, we will also increasingly rely on Discord later in the semester to possibly organize group work. Um, you don't have to use it. If you want to keep your group internal communication to somewhere else, you can totally do that. But we offer this Discord server as like a common platform for everyone to get in touch. Um, one thing to note here is that if you join the Discord server, please choose, you can set a diff different nickname just for the server um, and maybe use a name that we can somehow match to the person that we see in our registration list so, so that we know if you ask the questions who we're actually talking to. Uh, that would be really nice. Um, okay, the next thing is the requirements. Uh, we already saw that we expect a basic level of Python proficiency and also some experience in machine learning techniques. Um, we also talked about the questionnaire. If there are any questions or problems that you want to bring to our attention about this questionnaire, something you are unsure with, of course, just ask or write us a mail. Um, we can also Oh. True. That's much more pleasant. Um, yeah, just write us a mail or ask now um, about any problems you might encounter there um, so that we can solve this. Um, a Leipzig specific remark is that if you take this course, and this is mostly related to digital humanities students, um, you can't take this course if you have already taken citizen science in some of the previous semester. Um, and that is because we share the same module number, even though the course is renamed now. Um, so you can't have both on your transcript records. Just a technicality, but um, we asked the student bureau about it. They can't do anything about it. So if you have already taken citizen science, you cannot use this course as like a second grade. You, of course, feel free to take the course and sit in here, but uh, we can't give you a grade for it. Um, okay, regarding communication, of course, we have this website where we will and I will get into this table later, um, publish all of our materials weekly. Um, before each session, we are going to publish whatever materials we are going to use there, um, but in unfinished form. And then after the session, we will um, also upload the solution so you can check whatever you did during the session if that matches up with um, your solution. Yes. Um, the table should look similar in Weimar, but the course page will be different. So this table should be, it may look like a plain HTML table because it doesn't have it all the nice uh, styling from this web page, but the content will be exactly the same. Um, okay. Communication, we already covered Discord. Uh, we might reach out to you via email. As I mentioned, we don't have an email list as of yet, but once we get the full one, we might also send out mails there, so keep, be sure to check them regularly. 